Hi everybody, welcome to TIA Now. I'm Clarence Reynolds. Corporate tax reform legislation is moving through Congress as we speak, and today we're joined by Brian Hendricks, head of policy and government relations at Nokia Americas region, and political consultants Elizabeth Gore and Brian Wild from the lobbying firm Brownstein Hyatt Farber Schreck to discuss both the Democratic and Republican perspectives surrounding the tax debate in Washington. Thanks for joining us, all three of you. you. So could you give me sort of uh, an update on where things stand right now? Sure. So I guess I'll start. The uh, Ways and Means Committee has a bill. Chairman Brady put out a chairman's mark. He's already amended it twice since the mark came out. Uh, and the committee's moving forward with it. And. Um, you know, I think we're expecting the Ways and Means Committee to, to actually complete that sometime this week and be on schedule for, for being on the House floor next week uh, with the Senate right after that. So we're, we're moving along exactly how the Speaker said we were going to go, at least to this point. The wheels haven't come off, so uh, we'll just keep moving forward. Yeah, and the Senate's indicated that they're planning to put a proposal out um, the middle of this week and then uh, move to mark up maybe as soon as next week. Mm -hmm. uh, so again, as Brian was saying, this is on a tight schedule and they seem to be moving forward so far. I think the Senate is more likely to get slowed down than the uh, House. There's less uh, margin for error in the Senate and th they just have a lot more players that have a lot more ability to slow things down. So I think it's going to um, be much more difficult keep to their tight time frame on the Senate side, although so far uh, the wheels haven't come off as Brian said. <laughs> <laughs> and, and recognizing that the bill is still evolving right now, um, what are your thoughts on the House bill? Well, I have to say I, I was surprised with some of the provisions that were included in it when it was released. Um, first of all, the um, the committee has sort of taken on the real estate uh, industry, the with the mortgage deduction changes that they had, that's a really hard sell um, because it not only does it um, go after kind of the home builders and then uh, realtors, but listen, that, that can have a real impact on people's largest asset. And if they feel that that's threatened, that can erode support for the bill very quickly. Uh, there were also some provisions that I think were quite unexpected uh, in a number of areas, including education and energy and the international arena. And all of those um, are potential pitfalls. Um, maybe they won't uh, derail the bill in the House, but I think it may preview some problems that they might have in the Senate. Yeah, and I'll, I'll just, I, as a Republican, you know, I think the, the two things that surprised me the most are uh, the progressivity of the bill. It's it's far more progressive than I think a lot of people thought Republicans would, would come out with a bill. It really does help uh, lower middle class and, and, and the bottom brackets um, significantly and kind of punishes the high earners um, in, the, in the middle upper class. And I, I think that surprised me. I didn't think Republicans would do that. And then uh, the whole international tax component, uh, excise tax, on foreign affiliates is huge, and the way that they decided that they're going to handle uh, base erosion and earnings stripping, um, I, it's a novel idea, something that Republicans haven't brought up before, and I think that kind of took the business community by surprise. Yeah, I would just add, I think there were, there were some pleasant surprises and also some, some downside surprises that, uh, that have been noted here. The upside uh, surprise, I think, is that early drafts had, had talked about complete elimination of the deduction uh, for interest on debt, uh, which from a TIA member company perspective had some real concerns about how that might impact the ability of small and mid-sized companies to be able to access capital for broadband deployment. Uh, so the provision that's ultimately in the House bill is, is not what we would hope yet, but is certainly a lot better in that respect. And I think that reflects um, some advocacy from, from TIA and its companies. And then I think the big one, at least uh, for Nokia, that we've been thinking a lot about in the last 24 hours is the proposed 20% excise tax on transfers to foreign affiliates. It seems to be designed uh, as, a, as a mechanism for um, uh, people who have taken advantage of certain tax uh, base protections and, and dodges in the past. But as often happens when you develop legislation and you're hearing from a lot of different voices as a former staffer, you think you've got a representative feeling for how the community is going to react and then you put the bill out. And I think uh, there's some surprise already that 
really across the board. I think U.S. companies, foreign companies have all looked at that excise tax provision and said that's going to be a real problem, and we have to take a look at that. And I would just say, if I can just say one other comment about the content of the legislation that came out in the House. Listen, um, there was some real question about whether they could get to a 20% corporate rate and do it immediately and do it permanently, and they did. And so I think that that was a little bit of a surprise <laughs> because there was talk about phasing in or phasing out or some sort of middle ground in terms of rates. And in fact, they hit their target and they, and they hit it immediately. Taking all of that into account, what are the big hurdles that Republicans have to have that bill passed by Thanksgiving? Well, I, I think from my perspective, it's going to be some of these pay-fors that we've already talked about a little bit, and whether opponents to those provisions are able to rally the um, pushback that's going to be needed to, to slow this down. Um, their timetable is really aggressive, and it's smart for them to do that, right? Because they're trying to move forward be be before there's a lot of organized opposition. And it's a little bit of a race here to see whether um, those industries, those constituencies, those regions, um, those communities that are hurt by this bill um, are going to be able to push back in, a, in an effective way in a short amount of time. And I think that still remains to be seen. Yeah, I think that they really, I mean, I think there's two ways to write a tax bill. There's you pick one or two uh, industries or areas that are real big losers and you just write them off and you try to make everybody else happy, or you do what the House Republicans have done, which is everybody takes a little bit of a haircut and everybody gets a little bit of a reward. Um, but in the process, you know, high tax states have property tax issues that they're concerned about, and assault issues. You have the, they made enemies with the realtors and the, and the, the mortgage brokers and the home builders. Um, they've made they've made a series of strategic enemies that are that can be pretty powerful. So um, it's going to be interesting when this gets out of the committee to the full floor, where we saw healthcare get derailed on the full floor um, in a similar process of whether the Republicans can can hold it together. Um, so there's a lot of hurdles, but uh, right now everybody's saying the right thing. Where do you think the sticking points are going to be uh, between the House and Senate bills? So I I, I think that. Um, you know, indications, conversations that I've had, uh, you know, over on the Senate side, I th we're expecting some pretty significant changes between the two. So I think uh, there are international tax provisions that we've talked about, um, which are controversial in the House. The Senate's expected to do something totally different. Um, they have a lot more expertise in this area mm -hmm. um, and some pretty capable senators that have, have experience here. So I'm interested to see what that is. Uh, I was told that the, the treatment of pass-throughs and S-Corps uh, will fundamentally be similar, but the, the actual ratios might change a little bit. Um, so I think we're going we're gonna to see changes in that. Um, we have already have a senator, Senator Collins, has said that she won't vote for the bill if there's a state tax repeal in it. Um, so I imagine that won't be part of the bill. Um, so I think uh, the majority of the bill will look the same f as far as structures go, where the rates fall on the individuals and stuff, but I think when you really are a tax geek and you get into how this all works, it's going to be pretty fundamentally different. Yeah, I mean, one thing we haven't really talked about, it's a little bit inside baseball, but the process under which we'll be considering the legislation in both chambers is a little bit different. It's called budget reconciliation. You don't need large majorities to pass. Um, uh, but in the Senate, for example, you've only got a 52-48 split. So even under reconciliation, you can't lose a lot of votes. And one of the challenges here, as Brian was talking about, when you're when you're giving everybody a little bit of a haircut is that as you start to pull on some of those strings and some of those pay-fors maybe get set to the side by the Senate because they're too controversial, um, then you have another problem, which is that the deficit impact of the bill starts to get bigger and bigger. And then you have to start to worry about members who are already uncomfortable with a one, I think, a one and a half trillion dollar budget impact over 10 years. That number starts to get bigger. You start having problems with members who haven't stated specific objections to the bill yet. So it's going to be a very delicate balancing act. And I would just make another uh, follow-up remark to that. Um, the Senate has a very small margin for error, as Brian mentioned, um, and the Senate is facing a lot of sort of unknowns. They have um, Senator McCain, who has been ill and has been able to vote pretty pretty regularly, but every uh, now and then he has treatment that prevents him from being in Washington, D.C. Senator Cochran has been ill as well and has um, 
at some points not been able to be in Washington for votes. Uh, Senator Paul was recently assaulted and is uh, currently recovering at home. He's not in Washington to vote. Um, and then we have a special election that's coming up here in the beginning of December on the Republican side. We're expecting to see uh, a new Senator, Roy Moore, join the ranks of the Republican caucus. And listen, his vote's going to be very uncertain in terms of how he's going to come down on this issue. So all of that um, uh, sort of leads to an air of uncertainty because they don't have uh, many votes to lose. And then if you have a number of people whose attendance is uh, uh, up for question, um, that, that's going to be a complicating factor, I think, on the Republican side as well. And just one other point real quickly. I think while most people expect that there will not be uh, significant Democratic support in either chamber for the bill, I don't think people have necessarily given up hope mm -hmm. that in the Senate there might be one or two uh, Democratic targets that are in states won by uh, President Trump that might be willing to take a look at the bill and at least until it's clear they won't support it there could be some provisions being traded and and to see if they can get comfortable with the bill so that's that's an unknown as well and absolutely and the the the, the the caveat to that is that may, may make the bill more difficult to conference with the House. Mm -hmm. uh, to the extent that the bill moves towards the center or a little even uh, towards the left in order to bring on a couple of Democratic votes, um, you know, that makes it more difficult to convince their Republican counterparts to, to support a compromise bill at the end of the day. So do we have a bill by Christmas passed? I don't That's normally happening. handicap things. I would, <laughs> I would, I would guess not. Okay. Certainly not. Maybe out of each chamber, but I don't think they've conferenced the bill and got a conference report on it by Christmas. So my prediction is that sometime in early December, probably there's a statement that comes out from Republican leadership that says, "Hey, we've made a lot of progress on tax reform, but we can't." Um, we can't get it all done. We're going to do a temporary, immediate rate cut on both the individual and the corporate side. We're going to go ahead and push that through the process before Christmas, and we're going to do the rest of tax reform later. So I think a bill gets done before Christmas, but I think it's a straight rate cut with none of the um, reforms that we've been talking about here today. So I, I've been a pessimist from the beginning on this process, and and have not thought that Republicans, after they've failed on health care and, and had such a big problems with the budget itself, that they could actually get even to this point. And um, I'm changing my tune. I, I'm kind of an optimist now. So I, I think that they, we have a tax reform bill that gets signed into law, um, but I don't think it happens until February or March of next year. I, I think the Senate has a lot of complicating factors. Um, and they're just a slower moving, more deliberative body, body on, on purpose. So um, I think we're, we'll get there, but I don't think it's gonna be by Christmas. Um, and I'll just remind you, like within, you know, in addition to the fact that we're trying to do tax reform, we still have to fund the government. There's a lot of actual basic <coughs> legislating that has to happen um, in a pretty small window. So at some point, the Senate's gonna have to set this aside to, to actually pass an appropriation. Yeah, and that's actually a pretty significant point in the about passing a budget because uh, reports, at least in the last 24 hours, have been that those conversations haven't even really started to take place, uh, which means that we're going to get very close to that December 8th deadline uh, without having had an ag agreement on a framework, which means the last part of November and the first part of December is going to be all hands on the budget, so you're going to lose a little bit of uh, potential opportunity to, to do taxes in that window. Any final thoughts about tax reform in general, about this process particularly? Hey, I, I, I think um, this has actually been a long time coming. This is, we've been in this process for as long, I've been in DC for 25 years now. Um, there's been fits and starts and reiterations of it. Um, the fact that we actually have a chairman's mark that's getting marked up in the Ways and Means Committee that is a comprehensive tax reform bill is a win. And uh, I think that Republicans have done a lot more than anybody, including a lot of Republican supporters, thought they could do. Um, and so um, I, I'm just I'm happy we're finally here. I think the bill could get better, um, but I, I, I feel good that that we've we've managed to get this far at least. 
So I'd just say that tax reform is difficult, it's complicated, and there are a lot of unintended consequences every time you try and use, move these levers uh, it, within the fiscal policy, within the tax code. My view is this probably shouldn't happen in two months. It probably shouldn't happen in six weeks. Uh, it's too complicated, it's too big, the ramifications are too far reaching, and I hope that the Congress and the administration are going to take the time that it needs and not try and meet some kind of an artificial deadline, uh, because I think the consequences if, of doing that could be really significant. Um, I guess I would say to that point that uh, tax reform doesn't happen very often. A matter of fact, I believe the last time it was done, I was in elementary school and cassette tapes were all the rage. So uh, it is complex. There are a lot of uh, issues. And as you start to pull on these threads that are, are woven together, you can't always predict with precision what's going to happen. I think from a TIA perspective, what I would encourage member companies to think about is we're still at a stage where every voice matters in a sense that I think associations and certain large companies have had a chance to weigh in here but the bill now being public at least on the house side uh, gives people an opportunity to figure out exactly how it's going to impact your business and if there are messages that can be shared about how this may impact things like broadband deployment and availability I think those are important stories to marshal to share because it will be persuasive particularly in the senate where you have a lot of square state members who represent rural areas and thinking about impacts that aren't obvious at the, at the face of it, uh, such as broadband availability and those kinds of equities may, may be persuasive to that one or two members. Well, we really appreciate your insights and thank you all for being with us today. And you can have your voice heard here at TIA Now. We'd love to hear your feedback, so reach out to us on Facebook and Twitter. Thanks for watching.